Well, good morning, everyone. And I must say a big thank you to Steve. Like, as Steve said, we came across each other in 2009. And I've been working with Steve and Wholesale Investors since then. And I can't see you with that in front of my face. Um, and he's just, uh, he's just been so supportive and so dedicated. Like, and, and I must congratulate sitting here watching this presentation. Wholesale Investor is certainly, um, gosh, you know, they've, Steve's grown this company into something that really is fantastic. But on to my talk today. And so really not so much about the company, but I'm, I'm talking about the power of biodiscovery. And so unlocking the potential of natural resources. And in many ways, this is about innovation in Australia. We are, we are quite fantastic at innovation in Australia and we should all be very proud of, um, of what we do. So biodiscovery, what is biodiscovery? It's actually medicines um, from nature. And of course, this is really the beginning of the pharmaceutical industry. What became Bayer, the company Bayer, isolated um, aspirin from the bark of the willow tree. And then that, that was in the late 1800s. And that was the start of the pharmaceutical um, industry. And it started with biodiscovery. And as you can see here, some of our, there's some major medicines that we're still in use today. Most of them you will recognize, some of them you may not. Taxol from the bark of the yew tree, that's the, the taxanes, it's chemotherapies, and vincristin and, and vinblastin from the little Madagascar periwinkle, another important chemotherapy drug. And just to note, these are, I'll be talking about small molecules, but these are actually natural products, small molecules. In other words, molecules that we isolate from the biological system. So, okay, small molecules. So they're easy to manufacture and they're often easy to manufacture and often highly stable. So that means low cost of goods and that means a good profit margin. And also these are because of the many aspects of these, um, these drugs and these drug potentials, the, they really are PBS favorable. or In other words, governments are happy to support these, to support these drugs. 45% of all registered uh, medicines at this point in time was based on biodiscovery. So just note that for the next point. However, the biodiscovery um, success rate, now when we started the company in 2000 as a discovery company, there was some, still some big companies working in this space, GSK, AstraZeneca, but their success rate was extremely poor. It was really on average out of um, 1,000 collections, one of them may have some biological activity. And so the industry, and I think most people will know the industry, has actually moved to biologics. I think a good example of that is um, Merck's drug Keytruda. It's an immune checkpoint inhibitor for cancer. So we do have some fantastic biological drugs in the market at the moment. So why would we go back to nature? Well, the bottom line is the natural system is an extraordinary system and the, and the chemistry out there is quite extraordinary. So remarkable diversity of chemical scaf scaffolds. These, these chemicals are actually pr produced in biological systems and so their drug ability or their ability to survive in this system, which is ours, is really quite high. Plants and animals share common biochemistry and so most most biochemical pathways that we find in ourselves are also in plants, but the output of those biochemical pathways, they use for different, for different aspects. A good example of that is serotonin. I think most people will know serotonin. It's to do with sleep and it's to do with mood enhancement, but in plants, it's to do with growth and reproduction. So small molecules, they're very much important regulators of these pathways. And there's some good examples down there. So biodiscovery is a good idea, really lousy success rate. What are you going to do about it? So Paul Riddell, the other um, founder of um, the Cubiotics Group and I, we're former CSIRO research scientists. We were working on plant um, defense mechanisms of the tropical rainforest. So we put our heads together and, and rather than the usual approach, which was 
serendipity. Go out into a natural environment, collect what you can see, bring it back into the lab and run it through a um, bunch of screens. We actually applied a knowledge-based approach. The natural system really runs on chemistry. Organisms produce chemicals to repel, to attract, to get at their nutrients. And so we thought, well, look, we understand how the system works. And so why don't we apply that? So we came up with targeted approaches to find plant material with specific biological activity. And we, we combined um, plant ecological attributes with really how plants and animals interact. And so our platform technology is ecologic and that's 90% successful. So out of every 100 collections that we make, 90 of them have the specific biological activity that we're looking for. And that was really the start, the start of our company. All right, we've got some good ideas. Where do you actually look? Where is the best place to look for these compounds? And that's our extraordinary Australian tropical rainforest. We call it the ribbon of green down the east coast, and we only have about a million hectares le um, left now of our rainforest. But it's not quantity, it's quality. We actually have 13 of the 15 rainforest types worldwide. This is and that really the high, really high megadiversity in plants, and that equals megadiversity in, in chemicals. And so really, that is the best place to look. And of course, Australia is the only country in, in the, um, the only fully developed, highly developed country in the world that has tropical rainforests. And so we have the legal and political infrastructure to support this. It's basically to support ownership and intellectual property protection. So Australia is just a great place to be doing biodiscovery. Plants, plants are very clever. They actually don't, you know, they need a chemical to do a job. They don't just produce one chemical. They produce um, variations on the theme and this is an example of what it looks like. Um, Steve mentioned our anti-cancer drug, originally called EBC46. It's now called Tigil and Altiglate. And so what happens there is, what, what we've done is we isolate these, what they're called analogues, variations on a theme. And that allows us to work through how the drug works. The, it's called um, structure activity relationships. What parts of the molecule are the bits that work? And so we can actually select and also synthesize or semi-synthesize products that may be better than what we've actually isolated in the plant. So it really is a great place to, to look because it's not just the drug that you're working on, but basically you're potentially looking at extending the life of that through patents and new drugs as well. <clears throat> so we've got high um, biodiscovery, and this is a bit of a plug for the company as to what we do in our company. We, because we've got all of this great pool of innovation, we do a very hard cull early on and push our drugs, really try to make our drugs fail early. And the best place to do that is not in the lab with mice, but out in the real world. <clears throat> now I'm losing my voice. Um, with, with real world diseases. And so we actually work in the veterinary space to inform us as we move into the, um, the human clinical development. But of course, these are, these are potentially very, um, um, very valuable drugs that we're producing for the veterinary space. And so within the company, we um, basically um, have repeatable revenue because they're quicker to get out into the market. So small molecules solving major health problems. Let's have a look at cancer and tigil and altiglate. And I'm going to actually run through some examples of what we've been doing in the company. So tigil and altiglate is a small molecule. It's an intratumoral product. You actually inject it into the tumor. And I won't go into the specifics, but basically this is not a chemotherapy. This is a signaling molecule Part of the action of this drug is what's called a protein kinase um, activator. I won't go into the specifics, but the bottom line is this drug works very quickly. Within five to seven days, we see full tumor destruction. And then, of course, with tumors on the outside, you will left with a wound or a pocket. The drug also stimulates healing of that site and very rapid healing. And so that's the local um, tumor that's injected, this drug also stimulates a, a systemic effect and so it does run through the body 
and actually deal with, with um, metastasized tumors. It's very early um, in our development there, but we are seeing signs of that with our, with our drug. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the canine world, or dogs, um, and dogs with mast cell tumors. We've, um, we actually have developed this anti-cancer drug for the veterinary space. What you're looking at there is it's a, the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine Registration Trial. It's a phase three type trial. If you're not used to waterfall plots, the blue bits down the bottom underneath are the, are the good bits. And so this is really quite extraordinary. With a single injection, we had 75% complete response or complete destruction of the tumor, where there was a partial um, bit of the tumor left. We went in with a second injection that took that out to 88%. And this was durable, so no tumor recurrence um, um, with 89% of those dogs at 12 months. Keytruda, I mentioned, great biologic, great anti-cancer drug, but across the board, it has a 20% success rate. So this is really quite, a, quite an extraordinary success rate. And this is basically what it looks like. <clears throat> this is one of the dogs from the trial. Pre-treatment, inject the tumour. Day one, you're seeing the tumour vasculature break down, the tumour cell, um, cells themselves breaking down very rapidly. Day seven, full tumour destruction. That was quite a deep tumour there, great deep pocket. Day 28, sites healed up, excellent cosmetic outcome. And so really that is our, our drug. Just some other more tumour types. This is a drug that's effective against a range of solid tumours. So just a few other tumour types there. Soft tissue sarcoma in the leg of that poodle, oral melanoma on the puppy's face, and down to mixer sarcoma. And that is the dog that um, Steve was talking about in 2009. It's Steve's brother's dog. And as you can see, it's a CT scan. The, um, the tumour was fully... Um, filling the, the sinus area 15 weeks later, not only is the tumour gone, but that center sensitive sinus area was um, left untouched. And Stelfonta is the is and Altiglate. It's registered and marketed as um, for, uh, for canine mast cell tumours. We're also working on other tumour types in dogs and in horses as well. And so... Nice, um, nice potential for income there. So what about humans? We've, um, in our safety study, we had some great results. The drug was, the drug was safe. It basically well tolerated. We didn't declare what's called a maximum tolerated dose before we got a, a treatment dose. And this is an example here. This is metastatic melanoma, single injection into the first three top um, tumors, not into the fourth. And as you can see, what you saw in the dog, you're actually seeing in the human, out to day 35, complete response. Still a little bit of healing to, um, to do there, but a really nice response in this very nasty disease, um, disease type. But with this, um, with this patient, not only were the, the uh, tumours that we injected the drug into um, did uh, showed a complete response, but that little fourth tumour did as well. That could be a bystander effect. Also a tumour in the lung and on the sternum also regressed as well. And that's the systemic or an abs what's called an abscopal effect. So this is, you know, this is a, um, an isolated chemical from the tropical rainforest doing really well. We are in phase two clinical trials and we're working with global key opinion leaders and major hospitals worldwide. We've got a soft tissue sarcoma phase two running with Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York and a head and neck cancer um, study running with some major hospitals, the Royal Marsden and Guy's and St. Thomas in London. Certainly here, Kinghorn Can Cancer Centre. We're over in Wales. We're up in Brisbane at the Princess Alexander. And Gustave Roussy um, in Paris is the largest cancer institute in Europe. And yes, great potential for the market for this drug. You know, we hear, we hear about, you know, investment and we've had some fantastic investment in this company over the years that we've been running. And what we're pushing for is a great return on investment for those incredibly dedicated and wonderfully generous and supportive people. So we've done cancer. Now let's have look at have let's look at wound healing. So wound healing. 
this is a very interesting area. The, um, the products are littered with mostly new changes on a Band-Aid. And so, okay, the major causes of industry, uh, um, the major causes of serious wounds really have, okay, they've changed somewhat. We're still, we're not quite um, stabbing each other or firing arrows at each other mostly these days. So from the 15th century, but the first land standard of care has not changed. We're still using surgical deprivement. We're still using bandages and hey ho, we're back with the maggots as well. So it really is a space that needs some, that needs some attention. EBC 1013 is our wound healing drug in development. And this is a very interesting drug because it has the three major modes um, of action that is needed for a good wound healing product. It kills the bugs. It has an antimicrobial effect. It has infill of the wound without, um, without, mostly without scarring. It covers the wound. And this is a drug that we're developing for acute and chronic wounds and burns. The US military is interested in this drug, so it really is quite an amazing drug. We're, we're kicking off with venous leg ulcers, and we are preparing for our first in human trial at the moment. And as you can see, this is a big market just in that one chronic wound. And here's an example of what it does in the veterinary space. The top is a... Um, the um, top line of photos, that was a dog with a big tumour on the leg. It was removed surgically and the vet could not close that. It could not close the area. The white there that you see is bone. We applied EBC 1013 in a gel three times, seven days apart. Nothing else for this dog. No antibiotic cover, no bandaging. Day 19, you can see that beautiful infill. And as you follow that eight, day 78, completely healed, no scarring, and the pigment is coming back. The second set of photos is a burn on the back of this poor puppy. We saw the dog eight days after the burn. Now, this dog was in for a lot of trouble, a lot of infection, a lot of scarring, etc. We applied the, um, applied the gel three times, seven days apart, just followed those pictures through. Day 38, pretty well healed up. Day 73, healed up, no scarring, hair grew back the same colour. We're, we've been working on this drug with the Cardiff Institute for Tissue Engineering and Repair for about the last eight years to understand what is going on here. They believe it's not just um, wound healing, it's, it's, it's site regeneration. We are also interested in this drug for the cosmetic application. So again, these marvellous little molecules from the tropical rainforest doing some pretty fantastic things. Okay. Cancer, wound healing, what's next? We're actually looking at antibiotic resistance. Just a quote here from Dr. Robert um, Redfield, the director of the US Center for Disease and Control. Stop referring to a coming post-antibiotic era. era. It's already here and we really are in trouble. There's 16 bacteria now on a drug resistant list. And in 2019, according to The Lancet, there were 5 million deaths associated with drug resistance. Scary times. Traditional approach to antibiotic discovery is to kill the, kill the bug, kill the bacteria. And unfortunately, widespread use, this is resulting in resistance. So what do plants do, particularly plants in wet, warm environments where bugs love to grow? They target virulence, don't kill the bug, but basically reduce its pathogenicity. And so this minimizes the pressure for resistance. This is the approach that we're actually taking in the company. Unlike current antibiotics, the virulence um, related approach is reducing, it reduces the potential, potential for resistance. And so there's a greater um, um, opportunity for commercial life. New antibiotics that are being developed, they're basically being put on the shelf because just for the resistant organisms. And so we have some really interesting small molecules that we're working with at the moment. They're active against um, both types of bacteria, gram-negative, gram-positive. You may be familiar with the, um, the golden staph, MRSA, but also the gram-negative Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a real problem. And our, our little molecules are actually having great fun there. So that's us. The, I will say, a plug for Australia and our amazing natural resources. 
We just need to understand how to unlock them. So thank you everyone for your attention.